Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Kat. And as I have mentioned before, my area of study, my expertise, if you will, focused principally on the literature and culture of the early modern period. And the individual that we are going to be discussing today arguably made my studies possible. Because one of the key resources that proved to be absolutely vital to my doctoral studies was a resource called EBO, which is to say, Early English Books Online. This is, quote, the definitive online collection of early printed works in English, specifically works printed before 1700. This video is going to take a look at the first Englishman known to have printed books the individual who brought the printing press to England. But before we take a look at today's topic, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to History Hit for sponsoring another video on this channel. History Hit brings you the stories that shape the world through their award-winning online history channel and podcast network. It's like Netflix, but it's all history. With History Hit, you can stream and download hundreds of hours of original history documentaries anywhere, anytime, on any device. You can watch on your mobile, tablet, desktop, Xbox or your TV. Brought to you by expert historians such as Dan Snow, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, Dan Jones and more. And as well as already having hundreds of expert-led programmes, they add two more every week. This year, History Hit have also published this fabulous book. It's the History Hit Miscellany. I have been loving it. It is absolutely chock full of fascinating historical facts, figures and finds. And as this year is speeding away from us and Christmas is now not that far off, I think that this book would be an ideal present for any history lover in your life. Or in fact, don't give it away. Just keep it as a present to yourself. And with that in mind, History Hit is offering a very special deal for people in the UK. And this deal is starting and is valid during November 2023. With this deal, you can get a copy of this book, the History Hit Miscellany, in addition to an annual subscription to the History Hit platform for just £49.99. And, 99 pence. and so it's worth pointing out that an annual subscription is usually £59.99. And 99 pence. So with this deal, you are getting both a discounted subscription and also a free book. So if you are in the UK and you want to access this deal, please do click on the link in my description box. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video. But now it's time for us to take a look at the life and legacy of William Caxton. Firstly, I want to say a big thank you to Gretchen for suggesting William Caxton as a video topic. William Caxton was born in the southeast of England in the early decades of the 15th century, at some point between 1415 and 1424, quite a large bracket there. As this frankly vague account shows, the details of Caxton's early life are spotty at best. We aren't sure who his parents were, what their names were, and we also don't know what form his early education took. But one thing is clear. He would have had to have left behind his schoolroom, wherever it was, when he was around 14. Because at that point, he began his apprenticeship in London. The warden's account book for the Mercer's Company records a payment being made for Caxton to be entered as an apprentice, which occurred in 1438. And this does suggest that Caxton's date of birth was therefore likely towards the latter end of that suggested date range that I mentioned just a moment ago. The Mercer's Company predominantly traded in fine cloths like silk. This trade necessitated close connections with the trading might of the Low Countries. From the Mercer's Hall, the members of this company had the capacity to generate incredible wealth. And with that wealth, and with the trading relationships that made its growth possible, came the capacity to influence matters, both locally and internationally. Put simply, 
England's politics and diplomacy, how well it was done, the direction of travel, had the capacity to either support or indeed endanger the Mercer's company's trade. So it was good business then to repurpose some of their wealth to apply the right kind of pressure to ensure that England's foreign policy went in their preferred directions. Equally, their agents overseas would seek to influence foreign powers to institute and maintain policies that best serve the needs of this company and its members too. Caxton's new master was Robert Large, an individual that appears to have generated the aforementioned wealth and influence. Indeed, there is evidence to suggest that this was a fortuitous placement with a highly successful master for Caxton's apprenticeship. More than a decade before Caxton became his charge, in 1427, Robert Large was made a warden of the Mercer's company. In 1430, he became sheriff of the city of London. And then, in 1439, so when William Caxton was just newly attached to his household, Robert Large became Lord Mayor of London. Robert Large died just two years after this, in 1441. This was while William Caxton was still apprenticed to him. In the aftermath of Large's death, it is unclear whether Caxton remained in the household of his former, now deceased master, so that he could see out his training in the charge of someone who was appropriately skilled also residing there, or if his apprenticeship was instead recontracted to someone else. If the latter was the case, it would require that any new paperwork or record of that recontracting has now been lost or indeed was at the time improperly recorded. What is apparent is that Caxton did enough to enter the trade and to take up the livery of the Mercer's company. Indeed, in January 1450, Caxton was in Bruges and able to act as surety for another merchant. This indicates that by this point, Caxton already occupied a position of both trust and familiarity within Bruges and also within the wider community of merchants because they were ready, willing and able to recognise him as a person that was capable of offering surety. From the early 1450s, Caxton chose to make his principal residence upon the continent in the Low Countries. And living and working in this location made learning to speak French and Dutch very useful skills for Caxton to acquire, which he did. And as you will soon find out, those skills of being able to speak and particularly translate from French and Dutch would become very profitable skills for Caxton too. But more on that later. While living in the Low Countries, Caxton also expanded the types of goods that he was trading in. Now his trade went beyond those fine fabrics, the silks of his apprenticeship, to include other various wares. For more evidence that William Caxton occupied a position of both trust and favour among his fellow merchants, we need look no further than the fact that by April 1465, he was being made governor of the English nation in Bruges. As N.F. Blake explains, quote, that Caxton became governor in the 1460s reveals not only his wealth, skill as a negotiator, and familiarity with affairs in the Low Countries, but also the confidence his fellow merchants had in him. Caxton's time as governor would surely have been complicated by the knock-on effects of that series of conflicts that have come to be known as the Wars of the Roses, during which time England's rival factions and indeed rulers either found support and did deals with, or fell out with and then rejected, their own English merchants, the King of France, the Duke of Burgundy, and or the Hanseatic merchants. To keep a firm hand on the proverbial tiller of trade during this time, as an English person overseas, must have been incredibly complicated. And so perhaps it should be seen as a testament to his capacities as governor that Caxton was able to weather these storms and remain in post until at least 1470 and that his time as governor came to an end because he resigned, which he did, it seems, because he had chosen to leave Bruges for Cologne in 1471. This new home offered Caxton the opportunity to expand his trading further still, this time to include printed books. It is possible this was not his first foray into dealing in literature, 
because he may well have been trading in the luxury manuscripts that were being produced in Flanders at around this time earlier while he was living in Bruges. However, when it came to trading in printed books, Caxton seemingly was not content to act solely as a merchant. Instead, he wanted to manufacture the wares that he was going to trade. Enter the 15th century French author Raoul Lefebvre, whose history of Troy of 1464 Caxton chose to be his first publication. It was Caxton that translated this text into English. It's unclear whether his work on this translation is what led him to Cologne in search of a press to print it on, or if his move there inspired him to create material for the city's presses and thus sent him to the translation table, so to speak. Caxton was back in Bruges in late 1472, and he was at this time accompanied by the printer and typecutter Johannes Veldener with whom he had already entered into a partnership to produce printed books while still living in Cologne. And so, Caxton set up his new printing press in Bruges. He made use of Veldener's type and, in the beginning, his composition, so that he could set to work on committing his translation of the history of Troy into print. This work was finally completed towards the end of 1473 or the start of 1474. It would be dedicated to Margaret, Duchess of Burgundy, who was the sister of King Edward IV of England. This text, The History of Troy, was the very first book ever to be printed in English. It has been suggested that William Caxton was hoping to capitalise on the English perception of the Burgundian court as a place of high fashion, that he hoped that by producing English translations dedicated to or approved by that fashionable Burgundian duchess, who was herself, of course, the sister of the English king, that he would create a product line that could generate significant profits for him in England. He would, however, go on to print some works in French, which some have suggested might point to him having been disappointed in the actual numbers of people who were in fact prepared to purchase English translations. Alternatively, these French texts might simply be down to William Caxton's desire to produce as much stock as possible in as varied a form as he could manage, and that perhaps he was simply not able to keep pace as a translator with the demands of the press that he was running as a printer. Of the 100 or so texts that Caxton printed during the remainder of his life, a high proportion of them would be in English. Caxton is credited with being the translator of around 24 of those texts, depending on who you ask. And in doing this, he was certainly bucking a trend, or indeed creating one. Having begun by printing the first book in English, he then continued to print in English. He fed a market that he had in many ways created for himself. But what is particularly impressive, I think, is that while Caxton was doing all of this, translating, setting up his press, learning to use his press in a way that earned him the most money possible, he was also continuing in the trade that he had been apprenticed in. He was also still being sent on diplomatic missions. Indeed, in 1474, King Edward IV tasked Caxton with negotiating on England's behalf with the Hants. And then, in the following year, Caxton would provide his king with ships that could carry that king's English army over onto the continent. And in both cases... Caxton received financial compensation, but also this served to secure his place in the King's Trust, which in turn would have increased the esteem that he was held in by his friends, neighbours and colleagues. By the end of 1476, Caxton had returned to England and had set up his printing press in a workshop that he rented for the purpose in Westminster Abbey, at the sign of the Red Pale. This was the very first printing press in England. Caxton would print an edition of Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales upon it in 1477. The choice is set up in Westminster, that most important centre of government, where monarchs, nobles and the clergy frequently convened, was a very good choice. Westminster was perhaps the principal location in which you might find individuals whose literacy and disposable income were both at a level high enough that they might act as a recurrent pool of consumers for all of Caxton's printed wares. And the fact that Caxton was also able to act successfully as a book merchant for imported texts that were produced on other overseas presses points, I believe, 
to the size of the market that he had managed to both tap into and to cultivate. I think that William Caxton was a truly fascinating and ingenious individual who can be credited with creating English printed literature. Indeed, perhaps we might even want to ask ourselves, without these foundations that Caxton laid down at the point that he did so, when would we have seen an attempt to translate the Bible into English? Would the playing companies of Elizabethan and Jacobean England ever have had their works committed into print, with or without their consent and involvement? When would the English language and spelling have become standardised? And in regards to this last question, if we take a moment to consider just how different Chaucer's English looks when we compare it with the English of, for example, Shakespeare from just 200 years after Chaucer, then perhaps we might then go on to consider how much English might have changed in the last 400 years since Shakespeare without those printed texts that arguably stabilised and indeed standardised the language. However, with all that being said, I do want to add a caveat to this before we finish up. While I am happy to say that William Caxton's decision to bring the printing press to England and indeed to print in English should be considered as a moment that both changed and shaped history, This was not, as I think is sometimes suggested, some overnight change. Caxton's printing press was of the type invented by Johannes Gutenberg in the middle of the 15th century. Gutenberg did not invent printing. Printing is far, far older. Instead, what he invented was movable type printing. And this technique would prove vital to the printing press as it became a tool that expanded text production, both in terms of numbers of print runs and also in speed of production. This expansion, however, would take time. It would take time to set up the multiple presses and to produce the amount of type required for printing to outperform the existing methods of text creation. And so books would remain expensive for decades, if not for centuries. In the early modern period, printed books were produced in comparatively small print runs, especially by today's standards. In addition, many early printed texts would leave space for hand illuminations to be included, as if to create some kind of hybrid text. By doing this, I think that these printing press operators were looking for their printed texts to be viewed as high-priced commercial wares, which would naturally reduce their customer base. However, as time went on, the options for less expensive printed texts increased. Chapbooks and broadsides, for example. These were made up of fewer pages and required just rudimentary binding or no binding at all. All being said, this made them less expensive to create, and quicker too. The change may not have been an overnight one, but it was, in my opinion, utterly revolutionary. And William Caxton should get his share of the credit for this. In 2002, William Caxton was voted into the BBC's list of the top 100 Britons, and he is also memorialised in Westminster Abbey. After William Caxton's death at the start of 1492, he was buried in the churchyard of St Margaret's Westminster. The Abbey's website recounts how the location of Caxton's shop has since been memorialised in an inscription that reads, quote, 1476, near this place, William Caxton set up the first printing press in England. This stone was placed here to commemorate the great assistance rendered to the Abbey Appeal Fund by the English-speaking press throughout the world, 1954. After all, where would the English-speaking press be without William Caxton's English printing press? The Abbey website also explains that, quote, In St Margaret's Church, a memorial was erected to Caxton in 1820 and is by the sculptor Henry Westmacott. This inscription reads, To the memory of William Caxton, who first introduced into Great Britain, which is somewhat anachronistic, as there wasn't a Great Britain for him to be introducing anything into at this point, but nevertheless, who first introduced into Great Britain the art of printing, and who, in AD 1477 or earlier, exercised that art in the Abbey of Westminster. This tablet of remembrance of one to whom literature of his country is so largely indebted was raised in the year of our Lord, that's in Latin, 1820, in Roman numerals, by the Roxburgh Club, 
Earl Spencer, KG, President. On the 30th of April 1882, a stained glass window was erected in St Margaret's, but was later destroyed in 1940 during the Blitz. However, the tablet in its marble frame that records this window being installed does still remain, and it sits just above Caxton's main memorial. Lord Tennyson wrote the lines especially for the window, the theme being Caxton's own motto, Fiat Lux. Thy prayer was, Light more light, what time shall last? Thou sawest a glory growing on the night, but not the shadows which that light should cast till shadows vanish in the light of light. At the base of this window is written, This window was presented by the printers of London in the year 1882 in the memory of William Caxton. Additionally, in the Edward Lloyd window in the north aisle of the church, which is one area of the church which did survive the Blitz, we see a representation of Caxton at his press. And all of this feels very fitting to me. So what do you think of William Caxton, of his life and his legacy? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. But I would also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will help to boost the engagement. And the more engagement video gets, the more YouTube goes on to share it out, which in turn will help us to grow this community. As we've been talking about Caxton, I think something print related make some sense. See what you can find in the emoji section and I look forward to seeing what you have picked out. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful and if you did please do share it with your friends and if you like the channel let some pals know about that too. You can tell me you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you are subscribed, now is the chance to have a check. Make sure that YouTube hasn't for some reason unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear so that YouTube will tell you they claim when I have next uploaded, but also when I am planning to go live, which I do when we're talking about the history news. And I know you're not going to want to miss that. We have now got a fail safe. If you head over to my website, which is www katrinamarchant.com and add your email to my mailing list box then I can let you know what I'm up to that way as well. I hope you're going to have a great day whatever you're doing and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.